Welcome to today's session, Streamlining Oracle Workloads from On-Premises to VMware Cloud, VMware Hybrid Cloud. My name is Sudhir Balasubramanian. I'm a Staff Solution Architect and the Oracle Practice Lead. I'm joined by my colleague, Ryan Kelly. Hey everybody, I'm Ryan Kelly. I'm a Staff Cloud Specialist with VMware Cloud and AWS and I work at VMware. All right. Thank you, Ryan. All right, so standard disclaimer, uh, let's move on. All right, so this is the agenda for today's discussion. Essentially, this is a jam-packed agenda, so we will start with talking about some of the benefits of running Oracle workloads on a VMware platform. We'll talk about the overview of software-defined data center. Ryan will be walking you through that. Ryan will also be talking about the VMware hyper-converged infrastructure, HCI, vSAN, and then a bit, a bit of detail into VMware NSX. We'll also touch upon high availability, disaster recovery, performance monitoring, capacity management. We'll also touch a bit on automation orchestration, followed by running these workloads on a VMware hybrid cloud. We'll focus on VMware cloud on AWS, and then we'll wrap it up with a lot of collaterals and links at the end of the session. So let's get moving. All right, so let's look at some of the benefits of running Oracle workloads on a VMware platform. So any application that is deemed business critical, they have certain SLAs, they have certain RTOs, they have certain RTOs. Essentially, they have a set of stringent requirements. For example, availability. Well, this application must be highly available. This must be resilient. This must have redundancy, et cetera. Performance, which is an important aspect as well for any application, right? For example, the, any process should complete in a timely fashion, and that's very critical. And of course, one should avoid bottlenecks. The third is recoverability. Now we spoke about RTO, we spoke about RTO, RPO. You know, what's the mean time for delay? What's WRT? These factors must be very low. The recovery plans must be verifiable and repeatable. And last but not the least, scalability, right? It should be adaptive, it should be able to scale up, scale out, it should be able to add compute, it should be able to add memory on the fly without bringing any of the applications down, right? which basically helps all workloads when we run these workloads on a VMware vSphere platform. For example, resource maximization. You know, with server resources increasing too much for one application instance, virtualization actually improves resource utilization. It makes sure that the wastage is reduced, so then you're able to fully utilize the hardware, you're able to maintain application isolation. The second that comes to my mind is enhanced availability, right? Native application HA features, they are incomplete for most critical apps. For example, if you have Oracle Rack, Rack provides you at app level HA, but then if one were to run Oracle Rack on a VMware platform, right, what we also get is VMware HA that provides you infrastructure level HA, and that marry that across, or marry that with running the same infrastructure across metro distance, now you get site level HA. So simply by deploying Oracle Rack on a metro distance vSphere or a VMware stretch cluster or a vSAN stretch cluster, one gets three levels of HA. And if you take a look at the Oracle workload design methodology, right? essentially we start with the requirement gathering phase, right? and then we have to sell the project to certain stakeholders. And once we do that, and once we get a buy-in from the stakeholders, then we understand the current environment constraints. right? And then, at some point of time, we have to measure the workload, which is very critical, which is very essential. And once we do that, right, then we have to also tie in the database migration strategies. Then we also have to factor in the support in the licensing aspect. You know, we need to factor in, right, or we need to plan for the design considerations for sizing, followed by backup and recovery. You have to make sure that your applications are highly available and that we have a DR strategy in place. Last but not the least, we need to make sure that we have monitoring and tuning. But then, if you look at any of these steps of the design workflow, there is no one step that, that screams out, or there is no one step that is particular to any architecture here, whether physical or virtual. So all we're trying to say here is, there is no change in the design methodology if one virtual virtualize Oracle, right, any Oracle workload or any Oracle application on a bare metal versus running Oracle on a VMware vSphere platform. All right. So, this slide talks about the performance best practices and essentially the key thing to keep in mind is best practices needs to be inculcated into every layer of the stack, including the virtualization layer, to make sure that the workload, they can take advantage of the underlying, moving on. All right, so this slide, this talks about the overview of migrating the Oracle workloads to a VMware vSphere on-premises, right? So, 
as part of migrating oracle workloads from one platform to the other platform right the first order of business right that is to understand or that is to identify the nature of the source platform and why is it so critical what happens is once you look at the physical architecture here well that could be you may be coming off a sun solaris the spark environment you may be coming off hp ux well you may be coming off an ibm ax environment and these environments are what are called big endian systems right a big endian system essentially the big endian ordering that places the most significant byte first and the least significant byte last and i'm going to hand it over to ryan at this point of time thanks adir yeah if you want to go ahead and progress to the next slide so the first part we're going to talk about is the virtualization layer so this should be pretty familiar to to most folks it's about a 20 year old technology and this really is the foundation of the software defined data center the compute virtualization the software defined storage as well as the software defined network and we're going to talk in some more detail about that as well as we go on so just to catch you up, there are several new features that I think are going to be a huge advantage to our Oracle database customers that were somewhere introduced in vSphere 6.5 as well as 6.7. And they are specifically addressing business critical type of applications. So some of those include uh, the virtual NUMA, so the core protect dependency, is disconnected uh, virtual hardware 13 so you can build vms that are much larger so up to six terabytes maximum memory uh, a lot of enhancements to the mvme uh, adapters to make sure that we're getting the network throughput as well as the bandwidth to these types of virtual machines and applications and then a lot of changes to the pair virtualize rdma we'll talk about that as well and then uh, 512e drive support was added. And then we've also added some other large things like large memory pages. Uh, virtual hardware 14 and 6.7 brought us a VM with uh, NVDIM controller, 68 NVDIMs per VM, 0.1 terabyte non volatile memory, also persistent memory um, for. VPEM disk and VMEM disk. So it's going to give you that same high level of IO performance for your storage as well as your network, but also the ability to run much larger or what we've commonly referred to as monster VMs. So obviously there's Moore's law, you know, as, as memory is becoming cheaper and cheaper, as well as it's becoming more and more dense we are at the convergence and the the migration of more of the common flash based or uh you know writable drives to flash ssd and then uh moving into the ram as well as the cache and, and the cpu um, so what we're seeing more and more of our customers do is either they have hyper converged storage locally that's using flash or ssd or block type storage, or they have an array of devices to do that as well. And then we're taking advantage of some of these new capabilities with our, our virtual SAN or vSAN capabilities. Let me quickly talk about the Oracle use case here, right? Sure. So, I mean, you know, given, given, the, given the fact that vSphere 6.7 or 6.5, they are able to use persistent memory in, in two forms or in two shapes, right? One as a block device, and we call that vPMEM disk, or as byte addressable, essentially VPMIM, right? So the use cases here, right, for using it either as the VPMIM disk or PMIM is essentially accelerating the performance of the redo log files. And as everybody knows for Oracle databases, once you have, you know, any kind of glitch or any kind of hiccup in the redo log files, pretty much every processing comes to a halt, right? So if we have to accelerate the performance of the redo log files, this is an excellent use case. The second use case that we came up with was the, uh, the flash cache for Oracle, right? Or the smart flash cache for Oracle. And last but not the least, you know, potential reduction in Oracle licensing. So the link at the bottom of the slide, right? That basically talks about these three use cases and it goes into a lot more uh, depth than what we can in this session here today. So I would highly recommend you guys to look at the paper. So we recently released vSphere 7. If you haven't had a chance to upgrade, I highly encourage. There's a lot of new features as well as just general bug fixes as well as UI enhancements and and some some fun new uh, features that I think really apply to 
these business critical type workloads, especially Oracle. So let's talk, switch gears, we'll talk a little bit about vSAN. This is our hyperconverged storage offering that's part of our VMware Cloud Foundation platform, as well as it could be purchased separately. Next slide. So to quickly bring you up to speed, in traditional storage, there is a shared storage array. It's usually attached by some sort of fiber channel or iSCSI connection via switch gear. And then each of those ESX hosts are, their storage is located on that traditional shared storage. With the vSAN approach, what we've done is we've taken that storage that was external and then we, we put it inside the hypervisor on a flash SSD array uh, locally on the actual ESX host. And we create a, a stripe of all the data across all the hosts. So there's complete redundancy, there's performance, but also again, with that DR, new DRS enhanced features, we can move things around using vMotion to find the best place for that type of workload and the best type of tier of storage that it requires. All right. So I think, uh, okay. So with this, right, what we need to understand, uh, uh, and then as Ryan mentioned, right, we have different kinds of uh, vSAN. So essentially we have the hybrid and then we have the all flesh vSAN array, right? The hyperconverged infrastructure, right? But from an application perspective, what is actually changing? And what's not changing when deploying Oracle workloads on different vSAN hardware and software versions? So what really doesn't change is the deployment model of an Oracle rack for high availability. What doesn't change is the way that we set up Oracle Data Guard for DR. What doesn't change is the Oracle RMAN usage for backup and recovery. So none of the none of the monitoring tools, none of the troubleshooting tools that we use when we deploy Oracle on a physical hardware, a physical architecture, that changes when we deploy Oracle on a VMware vSAN environment. All right, so changing gears a bit, right? So what we also did was we deployed an Oracle 12C data warehousing database, right? On an all flash vSAN, the version was 6.7, and we ran load test. Right? What we got was very favorable result, and that has been documented on the white paper in the link provider. Over to you, Ryan. Awesome. Yeah, so just switching back to the software defined data center, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the networking component. So, VMware NSX is our, powers our software defined networking. Next slide. So essentially what NSX does is it creates a virtual barrier between your software components, your applications, your virtual machines, and your network. And it allows us to do some pretty amazing things of be able to have networks inside of networks, use firewalls, have, uh, have intrinsic security. So at a kernel level, we can have east-west security traffic as well as north-south with pack inspection and things like service insertion using our partners like Palo Alto Networks. Uh, but it also puts that control plane in the hands of the administrator to, to be able to do things as well like extend networks. So extend networks across your data center, across geographies, but also to our public cloud partners to be able to extend your networks to something like a VMware powered cloud provider. Uh, we also offer things like distributed firewall rules to be able to control the access that certain VMs have to other VMs that may be on that same hypervisor. So there's no risk of you know, security breaches or VM exit from one VM to another that may just be on the same virtual network segment. We can control all that through our NSX security controls. Next slide. So one of the things that we allow you to do with NSX is to analyze that east-west traffic. So you'll be able to see, you know, what's talking to and from that application. And some of it may be legit type of communication. So, uh, you know, web server obviously talks to a database server to deliver the web page. It's completely valid, but does it need every port open to do that? Probably not. You probably just need whatever the database ports are and port 80 to be accessible. And then you could block off every other port. And what's nice about this is it protects that VM, even if it V motions to another host in the cluster or another cluster in the same data center, 
it keeps all of that security intact because it's at the actual ESX host level, not at a at some physical north or southbound firewall. Next slide. So as I mentioned, the network insight can also help you get cloud ready. So you know, moving a a system on prem from you know like an AIX to a Linux platform on vSphere is probably less challenging. You're in the same data center. You have a lot of the network same network interfaces. There's not a a firewall to go through. But when you're moving to a public cloud service like VMware Cloud and AWS or other cloud providers, you're going to want to know what those those servers are talking to and Network Insight can help with that as well. So it can analyze again all those dependencies and then give you a, a readout of which applications should actually move in that migration. Also with public cloud providers there are things like uh, egress traffic, so any traffic leaving the data center. So what you don't want to do is go ahead and move a whole application and then the Oracle database is sitting back in the data center because you're going to have a lot of traffic going back and forth over that connection. That could be costly, but it also could incur performance issues. So depending on how far or how fast that connection is, there may be latency involved in talking back to those applications that are on-prem. So something like Network Insight is going to be really handy to be able to tell you exactly which applications are part of that, that full stack and then allow you to plan your migrations accordingly and move all of those at the same time. Next slide. Yeah, so quickly to add to that, Ryan, right? In this case, the uh, use case that we could use here is an extended Oracle rack across sites with uh, VMware NSX. And as, as we know, Oracle rack that requires active networking from each respective site, right? So all of the nodes need to have IPs in the same segment. And if nodes are placed in the multiple site, then we would need to set up a solution right, in order to allow the same segment in both data centers. So this is one use case that we came up with the extended Oracle rack and the blog at the, the link at the bottom of the slide that, uh, that talks about the blog and also has a link to the, to the actual demo. All right, but awesome. moving on to the next one. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about high availability and disaster recovery. So we've got, next slide. Again, part of the software divide data center are solutions as well as technology for you to do things like data protection, data replication, as well as full disaster recovery. And we'll talk a little bit about those now. If you want to jump to the next slide. Sure. Okay. So, I mean, this slide talks about the Oracle rack on VMware vSphere proposition, right? And essentially that goes back to what I mentioned before. Right. The question is, I mean, why do customers across the world, they readily deploy Oracle Rack on a VMware VCO platform? So what happens with Oracle Rack, as I mentioned, you get the application level high availability. You also get the ability to do rolling patch upgrades and also the fact that you're able to have workload mobility and balancing. I mean, simply by deploying Oracle Rack on VMware vSphere, what we get is greater uptime than running Rack on physical as VMware HA and Oracle Rack, they're completely complementary technologies, right? So with Oracle Rack, you get app level HA, which you get right out of the gate. And then with VMware HA, you get the infrastructure level HA, and that across metro distance gives you site level high availability, which I spoke about. So you get three different levels of HA simply by deploying Oracle Rack on a VMware uh, platform, and right, and if you were to stretch it across metro distance, you get the third level, right? And the proof to this, uh, the proof actually is in the pudding here, because during the past couple of years uh, on VM uh, on VMworld, we have run numerous Oracle Rack sessions, right? We have been running, able to run this successfully, right? And then we have had customers up on stage who spoke about their experiences and about their implementations running Oracle Rack on a VMware vSphere platform. Okay? And the key thing to take away from the slide here is the meddling note 249.212.1 that essentially says November 8th, starting November 8, 2010, Oracle Rack 11.202 onwards is supported on a VMware VCF platform. So all versions of Rack starting 11.202 right, is supported on a VMware VCF platform. So here, right, uh, let's let's have a look at this slide. And essentially this slide talks about 
you know, the uh, disk layout, right? It talks about the disk layout of running an Oracle rack, right? Essentially on either a VMware, you know, a vSphere platform or even on vSAN or for the matter of uh, purpose of discussion on even on VMware Cloud on uh, AWS, right? But the key thing to keep in mind is, you know, this Oracle rack virtual machine, it has two types of VMDKs, right? One is what's called the non-shared, non-database VMDKs, right? Essentially that is the operating system disk that houses the root file system and also the Oracle binaries, right? And also the grid infrastructure binaries. The second kind of VMDK is the, the clustered VMDK or the shared VMDK that essentially is the shared Eagle Zero Thick database VMDKs. And the way you make that shared is by using the multi-writer attribute, right? Which enables the in-guest systems leveraging cluster aware file system, right? And that which have the distributed multi-writer capability, right? So one thing to keep in mind is that a certain limitation using the multi-writer attribute and those limitations can be found in two KB articles, I mean 1034, 165 for VMFS and also for and also for vSAN, the KB article is 212, But one of the most important restrictions is that VMware vSphere storage emotion migration that is not supported for shared disk using the multi-writer attribute, right? And again, as we spoke about in the previous case with non-rack uh, workloads as well, para virtualized SCSI drivers is recommended for Oracle devices because it's very efficient, right? And then we also also recommend that the LUNs are spread across multiple SCSI controllers, right? A key thing to mention here is starting VMware vSAN 6.7 patch level 01, P01, we do not need to have eager zero tick uh, requirement for Oracle rack multi to disk. Now this applies to other cluster solutions as well, right? Running on vSAN that uses multi-writer for clustering. For example, if you're using Red Hat clustering or if you're using Veritas InfoScale as well, we don't need the devices which are shared, right? Which have the multi-writer capability to be eager zero thick, right? That's one. The second point here is extended Oracle rack, like we, uh, like we mentioned before, right? That provides HA across Metro sites and that is able to scale both uh, horizontally and vertically. The same use case is here on vSAN as well, right? Key thing to keep in mind, rack is disaster avoidance. Rack is not a disaster recovery. So on that topic, you know, there's a feature that's been around for quite some time, the, the Metro storage cluster to be able to have active active vSphere hosts on, you know, typically on a Metro campus type of data center environment. So you have a, a location, say for example, San Jose, and then you have another location in San Francisco. You can synchronize the storage between those two sites and then be, be able to vMotion between those, but also have racks set up across both of them. So I think this is something that would be interesting as well to, to Oracle customers. It's, it's something built into vSphere. Uh, it's a proven mature technology. We've got you know several hundreds of customers using this today. We also offer the same solution, we'll talk about more later in our VMware Cloud Native US offering and you know the same functionality that we, you would get on-prem just between two availability zones within Amazon. Right, so if I were to take an example here, right, using v, uh, VMware vSphere Metro Storage Cluster, right, uh, we could use that using EMC vPlex as well. So as we can see here, Oracle Rack that manages the nodes across Interconnect, so the virtual volume that is synchronously replicated over the vplex interconnect and then just like any other uh, clustering solution across metro distance the uh, emc vplex also has what's called the witness and that provides the failure resiliency via storage monitoring and the vplex witness that's actually required it's a required component for an excellent oracle rack on vplex and the link at the bottom that's the kb article and that talks in detail about how you are able to set up an excellent oracle rack on these vmware vsphere metro storage cluster using emc vplex awesome so let's talk about site recovery for a moment here so femur site recovery it's proven over 15 year old solution it it provides a interface for and technology and capabilities to be able to replicate your storage from your existing data center to an alternate data center or to the cloud. Uh, it can use vSphere replication, so just using the local, whatever storage is presented to the data store, which includes vSAN. It can also utilize, utilize array-based replication, so if you have something like a network appliance or EMC 
and you want to replicate at the storage level, that's also supported. It does also offer an interface for a run book, so it can make sure that it starts everything in the right order. It's gonna, you can schedule to start, you know, your Active Directory servers, your DNS servers first, and then your database servers, and then your web servers in whatever order critical to non-critical critical to dev servers. Uh, and this is something that is is also part of the our cloud offerings. If you wanted to, again, replicate images up to the cloud. This is a disaster recovery solution, so we don't want to confuse it with backups. Uh, the perfect analogy I have is a backup is, you know, something that sh if you deleted a file or installed an application and didn't go correctly and you want to restore that from a previous night's backup, that is more of a backup. A disaster recovery is much more a burning hole in the ground, so the whole data center is gone, and you want to quickly power on and restore that at another location. That's what Site Recovery Manager does. So what it is, is actually mirroring all of your existing VMs into another vSphere environment, completely powered off, and then in the event of a disaster or failure, you would just power all those on in that runbook order that I identified. Next slide. So something like a rack database or any Oracle database for that matter could use this type of technology. So, so dear, can you explain a little bit more how that would work? Yeah, sure. So essentially if you look at the setup here, right? So we had an Oracle primary database in site A, right? We also had standby database at site B. And essentially, the shipping of the logs is happening using data card, right? And one might just stand up and ask, like, who is actually doing the actual replication? In this case, we use Oracle Data Guard to do the replication, right? And what happens is all the applications are connected to the primary database at site A. And let's say if site A were to go down, the application VMs are replicated to site B using this replication, right? And all we have to do for the database virtual machine is to switch over from site A to site B, right? Switch over to the standby database that's running on site B from site A, right? But then the way that we are able to do that is essentially on the post power on process of any virtual machine, we can embed a script and that script can essentially log on to every standby database and change the mode of the database from a standby to primary, right? And by doing it across all of the standby database, you are able to automate the failover of the databases right from site a to site b and then you're able to you know you know orchestrate the entire recovery in a short period of time right the keep in mind here is srm or bc replication that's not doing the actual replication here the replication is done by the oracle data card what srm does is a workflow generator it's a workflow generator and that is actually able to orchestrate the changing of the mode of the database from a standby mode to a primary mode and the link at the bottom of the slide that basically shows the demo. I mean, that that's a, that is a demo as to how this whole solution was created. Awesome. So another feature that is probably missed by a lot of customers is the being able to do fault tolerance for protected VM. So if if you look at traditional HA, if a host fails, what happens is the VM is powered on by any surviving host. Uh, but with fault tolerance, what's happening is we're actually mirroring the memory across the cluster so that if a HA event occurs, a host goes down, we can actually reinstate that VM live without a full shutdown and power up again. And then we can also use SRM protection with that as well. All right, so let's switch gears and we'll go up the stack to our performance monitoring and capacity management solutions. Next slide. So these also are part of the software defined data center. They are addressing our cloud management and automation orchestration solutions. And so we're gonna talk about a couple solutions to be able to do performance and capacity management, as well as automation and log aggregation. So within the tool, we're gonna to be constantly gathering data about how all of your applications are performing and then we'll give you periodic recommendations about how you could actually right size the environment. So you may have inadvertently, someone may have requested a server that was way too large and we, were, we see based on the utilization trend over the last two or three months, 
that it makes more sense to have that be a small VM, you know, remove CPU, remove memory from it. It may not need as much storage. And then we can actually act and, and implement those changes. We can also recommend where certain workloads could be moved to other hosts or other clusters in your environment to help free up that capacity as well. Next slide. And then we have this ability to do what if analysis. So instead of, again, you know, just second guessing what you would need to order, like if you have a new server order coming up and you're looking to buy new infrastructure on-prem, we can give you a readout of based on the current utilization, the current trend of new VMs in the environment, this is how many new servers you need and how much storage and the, the right sweet spot of CPU and memory for each of those environments. But we can also do things like if you're planning on moving some of those workloads to the cloud, for example, to the VMware Cloud AWS, we can do some migration planning to help you understand you know, how much capacity or how many hosts you would need in that new environment, which applications actually make sense to move there based on cost, network performance, as well as storage. And then we can do the same for, again, for on-prem as well. And then part of the migration planning, we can also do a multi-cloud comparison. So, you know, obviously we can do a comparison of our own solutions of so VMware-based clouds, but we can also give you an idea of how much those workloads would cost to move to something like native AWS or native Azure, native GCP or IBM cloud, just to give you a rule of thumb. So, you know, don't take our word for it. You know, we, we believe we're the best and the most affordable offering, but we do want to give you the choice and see how the other vendors stack up in that comparison. Okay, so with, with tools like VROps, right? So one is able, to, we are able to build custom dashboard for troubleshooting database performance, right? So for example, if we would like to find out, right, database blocks per transaction, is that increasing or is it decreasing, right? Based on certain SQL queries or access patterns or predicates, right? One, one is able to do that by creating all these reports, right? We can also find out if there has been an increase in the physical reads or increase in the logical reads. Is my database performance okay or has it deteriorated, right? All of these stuff, we are able to do that by creating custom dashboard for troubleshooting performance. And essentially you're able to do that using what's called the blue Medora adapters. With, with the VR ops, right? By using the tool called VR ops and blue motor adapter, essentially you have the flexibility of either going directly to the Oracle Enterprise Manager to extract metrics for every database that is managed by the OEM server, or you're able to go to the DB or the database directly to extract the metrics for that database alone. So, I mean, VR ops along with blue motor gives you a lot of flexibility. It gives you a, an opportunity to ensure that you're able to troubleshoot, monitor your application or database applications very, uh, and then even look at the metrics very granularly. Awesome. And then another solution we have for log aggregation is VMware Be Realized Log Insight. And what this does is, again, just very similar to VR Ops. It takes trending of your logs. It can also deep dive into a certain log pattern or a certain host or a certain VM or even a certain database that you're you're looking to analyze and, and track the logs for. And it can also give you readouts as well as dashboards for trending or, or certain log events or, or information that you're looking for from that application to be able to, to monitor that application either at the initial launch of the app or as you've done a migration, if you're just trying to watch and triage how that act actual application is performing after a certain upgrade or a patch, Log Insight can help with that as well. And then now let's talk about automation orchestration. So we have a couple tools. Uh, we have a couple tools in this category. We have uh, vRealize Automation as well as vRealize Orchestrator. Uh, and Orchestrator is you know something that's been free as part of vCenter for you know, as long as I can remember, even when I was back as a customer, and it's actually a very powerful solution. It's been more tightly integrated with vRealize Automation, but a lot of our customers use it to actually automate the builds as well as the ongoing maintenance of their Oracle environments. 
And we believe cloud management is really fundamental to the SDC. So cloud automation isn't just that front end catalog for you know deploying your self service applications. Also for you know developers to be able to do kind of release automate automation extensibility. So being able to not just provision a full application stack or for full Oracle database, but also being able to extend functionality out to like, you know, add a database or do things like database as a service. And it integrates with all of your other ecosystem partners. So a lot of times the application isn't just about standing up the database. There is things you have to do for a load balancer. There may be container components that you need to use. Your developers may want to use Puppet or Chef to, to integrate some of the application level functionality. And then you're, ultimately you may need to tie into some sort of change control or ticketing system. So we integrate with things like ServiceNow, uh, also InfoBlox for DNS and um, all of your IP on IPAM integrations. So it's a kind of a one-stop shop for that full service deployment for your IT, just your IT self-service or just automating your actual build process for your server workloads as well. Why would we want a database as a service? You know, what, what, would, what would Oracle customers get out of that? I mean, typically if you look at any DB as a service, right? And this, essentially if you look at uh, Oracle Rack, right? See, why this solution or why this is so important is deploying an Oracle Rack, that's not easy. It's actually very difficult, right? Because let alone the very process for automating it. So the fact that it's too complicated because it has, it has a lot of moving parts, right? It has the storage part, which is shared, which needs to be shared, the networking component, which needs to be shared, the memory, right? And the fact that it requires a lot of coordination between the DBS and the infrastructure teams, right? And then one very important thing is, you know, you, you need to have an intimate track knowledge, which is required for any successful Oracle rack deployment. And of course, DBA needs to be involved as well for every rack deployment, right? And that's why customers they shy away from automating Oracle rack, and they basically claim or they basically say that it's easier automating Oracle rack, Oracle standalone databases than rack, right? So on top of that, right, customers also lack basic realized automation skills to automate the rack deployment, even if they are successful in overcoming all of the above hurdles. So essentially, what we have done here is we have developed a solution to tackle that issue. So moving on to the next slide, essentially this is what the deployment flow overview is, right? Uh, and if you look at the top, uh, the top left, uh, the end user requests a service blueprint and which triggers a BRO workflow, and that is requesting an Oracle Rack blueprint. So essentially what this workflow request is an Oracle Rack blueprint with passing specific deployment parameters and on completion, that actually adds the Oracle Rack cluster in the items tab, right? So the VRA blueprint itself, that deployment starts a number of components, right? It starts a VRO workflow, started by the event broker that updates the VM network properties. You know, there's a vSphere component for performing a clone uh, from a template for every host. And then what also is, is, you know, on completion of the cloning, a workflow updates the virtual machine hardware, right? With the controller and shared disk. And essentially, finally, it runs a workflow that orchestrates the entire Oracle rack and the database installation on different nodes, right? So I understand, uh, you know, we understand that this may be a bit too difficult, a bit, bit too complex here, but once that's a setup, it's very easy to create a two node or a three node or a four node Oracle rack, right? Simply by pushing a button here. All right. So, so Ryan, what are, how, are, how are we doing for time? Uh, I don't know. All right, let's keep on. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's talk about hybrid clouds. If you want to hit the next slide. So, you know, it's, it's what everybody wants. It's a cool thing now. Everybody wants to be able to broker, you know, different clouds for different reasons or several customers just may be in a, a cloud with certain applications that were just born there. And, and it makes sense to move their existing on-prem applications closer to those environments. So let's talk about some of the cloud offerings that VMware has. But first, let's talk about the challenges in, of implementing a hybrid cloud strategy. So, you know, there's 
decreased agility. It's, it's a long time to actually refactor your applications from a typical vSphere platform to a cloud provider. There's a lot of risks, you know, a lot of things can go wrong. If you move the application and you forget certain components and then there's latency and performance issues, or there could be situations where you don't even have the media to actually do a full reinstallation. And it's higher costs. There's a lot of rework. There's a lot of consulting work, a lot of, of effort at, to actually rebuild, retest, and reintegrate that application that may have been there for years or several years. All right. So, I mean, this slide basically equals the slide that we had before, essentially talking about migrating Oracle Worker from on-premises to VMware, uh, the on-premises environment. And at some point of time, right, if one were to one were to burst to the cloud, right, for myriad of reasons, whether that's a DC extension or whether that's a DC evacuation, or even for disaster recovery, or even for, let's say, the app modernization, right, one would choose one of the hybrid cloud offerings that VMware has in marketplace today. So you could probably move on. Again, just to give you an overview, the vSphere environment that you have on-prem is just mirrored in the Amazon data center. So we are just running on the Amazon bare metal. We're not, you know, nesting the hypervisor on top of it. And then we use all of that local bare metal physical hardware to carve out a vSAN data store. And then we use NSX for the overlay and being able to stretch the networks to and from on-prem. And then because we're in Amazon's data center, we have a high-speed connection for you to utilize any of the existing Amazon services. So if you want to use an S3 bucket from a VM or you want to use something like Lambda or you know Elastic Database or anything like that, that's accessible as well from that environment. Okay. So in this case, I mean, if you look at the slide here, essentially we talk about four general phases that's defined as part of deploying or migrating, let's say your workloads to the cloud, right? So the first order of business, as Ryan pointed it out in a couple of slides before, is to identify the network dependencies between various layers in the application stack. Right? So using a product like DRNI or V Realize Network Insight, here is an example that will help us identifying all these network uh, dependencies. Right? And I'm not going to go into the details about what VRNI can do, but uh, to just give you an example, right? We could, we could think about an SAP application system, which is connected to an Oracle database for the data, and that makes application calls via RFC or remote function call. And the SAP system also talks to an SAP HANA system, right? So by using DRNI, you're able to map out or you're able to you know, uh, correctly plot out, right, how every application is talking to a database. So if you have to then make a decision of moving this as a consistency, as a consistent set, right? one would have to move the app and the database across from on-premises to the cloud and vice versa because it really doesn't make sense in keeping the application in the cloud and databases on-premises and vice versa because you know the latency is uh, a bit too much for that kind of a deployment. So that's, that's the very first stage. And then as part of the second stage, right, we, essentially we have the design phase, right? See, uh, uh, and if you were to look at a slide here, right, this is essentially a three-site setup, right? And that included the on-premises site A, the site B, and VMware Cloud on AWS. The on-premises vSphere cluster on site A, that's running production workloads. Site B is running dev, test, DR workloads. They both are in a hybrid link mode. Site A and site B, they have access to their own dedicated storage. And site A is connected via layer 2 VPN to VMware Cloud on AWS. Site B, that's connected via HCX to VMware Cloud on AWS. Right. And as Ryan mentioned before, right, VMware Cloud on AWS essentially is you know, all the ESXi servers right, in a cluster deployment. So in this example here, the VMware Cloud on AWS, that's essentially in a stretch cluster deployment. Right? This is a six node stretch cluster, three, uh, six I3 servers right, across two AZs. So three servers in AZ1, three servers in AZ2. The storage in VMware Cloud on AWS, that's provided by the HCI vSAN instance. Right, and um, you know, uh, uh, as we know, it has two. Uh, the VMware Cloud on AWS essentially introduces two uh, introduces a new vSAN capability that provides two logical data stores instead of one. One is for management VMs, one is for customer VMs. Right. So this current solution it deployed three separate Oracle environments. Site A had, as you can see on the left, a production two node Oracle rack. And Site also had a production Oracle rack parsing. And essentially what it does, parsing, what parsing does is basically it listens to redo writes coming in from the production 
Oracle rack on the left, and then it passes it on to the DR Oracle rack that's set up on site B. Right now, a couple of a couple of important considerations when we talk about Oracle rack, as I mentioned before, Oracle rack on premises requires a shared VMD case to be deployed with the multi-writer attribute, and as of this and 6.7 P01 or Path 01, we do not require those shared VMD case to be eager zero thick. Right, and it can be uh, you know thin provision as well. The current restrictions of multi-writer attribute, as I mentioned before, is to disallow storage emotion. Now, now starting now looking at the Oracle Rack interconnect uh, setup here, right? Starting SDDC 1.8 version 2 for Oracle Rack interconnect traffic, right? The way we do it is to create a logical network. So if you look here, we create a logical network called Aura Private, right? So then we would have to navigate to the VMware Cloud on AWS portal. Once we go there, just go to the networking and security, click on segments, click on add segments. We have to pick the routed option. We specify the CIDR block of segment in the gateway prefix length field. And once we do that, you click save. And once we click save, that's how you're able to provision, or that's how you're able to set up the Oracle rack private interconnect traffic for the cache vision traffic. Now, the third phase is essentially the sizing stage where we have to size the Oracle workloads. You know, we base it on a number of factors here, right? I mean, it's very important to understand the characteristics of database workloads because that is gonna help us in the sizing phase. We need to size the target virtual machine vCPUs based on the operating system metrics, Oracle metrics, and that needs to be based on the current utilization plus we also need to include right, adequate capacity planning for feature growth. Now, along with that, we can also use the VMC online sizing tool, and that's based on the above DB and the over stats to get an initial idea of the Oracle landscape on VMC. Right? As I mentioned before, the workload characterization has a very significant impact on performance and accurate characterization that leads to a optimal design of an Oracle database architecture. Now, coming to the fourth phase, the fourth phase is either the deployment or the migration right, of workloads right, or from on-premises to the VMware Cloud on AWS. So in this slide, we're looking at deploying Oracle Rack, Oracle non-Rack workloads on VMware Cloud on AWS. Right? So deploying non-Rack workload on VMware Cloud on AWS, that's absolutely the same as one would do on-premises. Right? With VMware Cloud on AWS, as we already mentioned before, your ESXi host, they traditionally reside in an AWS availability zone. They are protected by VMware HA. This use case essentially was to deploy a virtual machine uh, on a single instance database from a template, right? And we followed every, we followed the Oracle database on VMware best practices guide to deploy a Oracle non rack workload, which is essentially a single instance database on VMware Cloud on AWS. Now, if we have to deploy an Oracle Rack workload on VMware Cloud on AWS, that's exactly the same as one would do, right? The one would deploy an Oracle Rack on premises. Now, the only subtle difference being creation of a logical network for the Oracle Rack private interconnect on VMware Cloud on AWS, as opposed to creating a dedicated distributed port group on premises. But apart from that, the rest of the steps from, let's say, provisioning or provisioning a shared VMDK or let's say compute or from a storage perspective, that is no different from on-premises. Uh, please make sure that the Oracle databases on VMware best practices guide that provides the best practice guidelines and the Oracle databases high availability guide is referred to when one deploys Oracle Rack workloads on a VMware cloud on AWS environment. Now switching gears a bit, right? When we talk about extended, when we talk about running or trying to deploy extended Oracle Rack on stretch clusters for VMware Cloud and AWS, right? So essentially, a feature called stretch clusters for VMware Cloud and AWS, that's designed to protect against an AWS AC failure. Now, the applications that can span across multiple availability zones within a VMware Cloud and AWS cluster, right? So running an extended Oracle Rack on stretch clusters for VMware Cloud on AWS, well, that provides the same advantages, as I mentioned before, as traditional Oracle Rack, right, across data centers, because in, in addition to the AWS AZ level protection that the stretch clusters were to provide. Now, the one thing that we have to keep in mind here is for extended Oracle Rack, the best practice is to spread the Rack virtual machines across multiple sites to ensure HA across sites, right? 
in addition to the infra and the application level ache because this ensures that all rack virtual machines do not land on the same site at the same point of time and this is basically done using compute policies using tags and attributes and all of that is documented in the guide the link is there at the bottom of the slide So all along we spoke about migrating a single instance database and migrating Oracle Rack from on-premises to VMware Cloud on AWS. Let's switch gears and let's talk about how we can migrate a single instance database from on-premises to a VMware Cloud on AWS. Right. So as we can see, using the web client, and this is a couple of steps here. One would just right-click on the virtual machine, right, and then one would pick the compute, the storage. Uh, method one would pick the correct compute resource pool the storage pick the destination network group and once it is done the virtual machine is now at VMware Cloud on AWS the same step would have to be followed when you're migrating back to on-premises from BMC the blog that essentially details all the step is there in the, the bottom of the slide here and there's also a demo uh, uh, the link is there at the bottom of the slide let's talk about migrating an Oracle rack environment to VMware Cloud on AWS and as I mentioned, starting SDDC version 1.8 v2, the version 2, the shared VMTKs in the multi-letter mode, they would no longer need the VMTKs to be provisioned as eagle zero thick. Right? So this is essentially a three-step process. What would need to happen is we would have to be, and this is again an offline process, one would need to shut the Oracle Rack cluster down. You would need to power off the VM1, VM2. We would just need to remove the shared devices from VM2 and that storage motion that to uh, VMware Cloud on AWS. We would then need to do the same step for VM1, accepting we would have to remove the multi-rater flag before we see the motion, the virtual machine one to VMware Cloud on AWS. And once we are there at the destination site, we would just have to add the multi-rater flag, um, right? And the steps for doing all of that is essentially detailed in the link in the bottom of the slide here. All right. So if you were to look at this final picture here, right? And essentially, right, we are able to migrate right, the DR rack from site B to VMware Cloud on AWS here. So if you look at this slide here, essentially your or a site A has the primary two node Oracle rack. There's a synchronous data replication that's happening from Oracle rack to Farsync, right? VMware Cloud on AWS, we have the stand, uh, standby two node Oracle rack. There is an asynchronous data card replication, replication that's happening from the far sync on site A to the standby Oracle rack. And as we mentioned before, one could also offload the Oracle backups right from the production over to the standby. And so you're able to save the compute uh, cycles from the production database, which could be used to service the actual workloads. You wanna talk to this, Ryan? Sure. Yeah, so uh, one of the, the tools that we have with VMware Cloud and AWS is the it's included with HCX and it allows you to stretch the networks as well as to do things like live migration. Um, and it uses vMotion, but we can also use something like replication. So it, it's part of our, one of the features the HCX bulk migration to be able to do multiple virtual machines to or from VMware Cloud and AWS. Um, just wondering, you know, how that plays into a running Oracle database. Yeah, I mean, you will be able to use HCX to migrate or single instance databases uh, from on-premises to VMware Cloud, uh, Cloud and AWS and back. Unfortunately, with Oracle Rack, there's a, the, the limitation of the current, uh, the restriction is with shared VMDKs. So one cannot use HCX with shared VMDKs to migrate them from on-premises to VMware Cloud and AWS. So for Oracle Rack, one would have to follow the migration steps in the reference architecture. Again, the link is there at the bottom of the slide here. Awesome. And then another solution that we talked about, the site recovery is actually included with VMware Cloud and AWS, um, or it's it's an add-on, I should say. So I think again, those same those same limitations would apply to an Oracle rack. You'd want to do the logs separately and then the applications through the actual SRM tool. Is that correct? Yep. Cool. Okay, next slide. And then this is- I think is this is essentially the, bringing it together. Right, go ahead. What, yeah, this, this is the reference architecture for 
Oracle on prem as well as in the cloud. So very similar architectures. Uh, again, it's the same same software defined data center is just running in Amazon's data center and it provides the same capabilities for you know all of your third party integration as well as your Oracle databases. And then newly announced this year, we have other options. So if your preferred provider is Google Cloud, we also offer VMR Engine for Google. Uh, very similar functionality. It's that same, again, software defined data center. This is a partner provided solution. So it is sold and operated by Google Cloud. It is not the same level of service and functionality as VMware Cloud and AWS. That's a purpose built solution built by VMware. But this is, you know, provides that same software defined data center as well as the same level of access to the Google server. Okay, so this slide talks about the Google support for running Oracle workloads on a GCD environment. I mean, as, as, as we all know, 249.212.1, the Oracle mysupport.com uh, Metalink note, that essentially talks about Oracle customers with an active support contract running support versions of Oracle will receive assistance from Oracle when running those products on a VMware environment, right? And uh, VMware, you know, by you know, VMware on its own, we are able to provide access to a team of Oracle DB resources within VMware and GSS to troubleshoot uh, issues related to Oracle databases running on a VMware platform, right? And then if needed, you can always reach out to the TSA net collaborative support for any kind of faster resolution or technical issues, right? But apart from that, at the bottom of the slide, there is the Google support for Oracle workloads on a GCV platform. And essentially uh, from Google, from the document I code verbatim, Google is fully committed to support all Oracle workloads on a GCV environment and the Google's cloud support extends the support described above to GCV customers as well. So you guys can have a look at the link at the bottom of the slide, but then moving on. Yeah, and also announced this year was the Azure VMware solution. So if you know your prefer, preferred provider is Azure, then we offer very similar functionality, the same software defined data center stack, all powered by vSphere, vSAN and NSX. And then again, it's adjacent to any of the the multiple AMAs or Azure services that you wanted to interoperate with. Next slide. Okay, so let me talk about the the uh, strategic alliance that VMware signed with Oracle Corporation September 16, 2019. And essentially, there were two offshoots. Right? One offshoot was the Oracle Cloud VMware solution, right? The product that was that's a joint product released by Oracle and VMware, and essentially Oracle became a part in the DCTP program, the VMware Cloud provider program and essentially uh, that's what the note says. Customers will have access to Oracle technical support for Oracle products running on a VMware environment. The second offshoot of that was the change to the Metalink document 2492121, right? That essentially says, I mean, this document used to have a lot of verbiage. Now it's been cleaned up. It, it's, it's short, it's sweet. It essentially says the same thing. Customers with an active support contract running supported versions of Oracle products will receive assistance from Oracle when running those products on a VMware virtualized environment. And essentially this support policy does not affect Oracle or VMware licensing policy. So just to reiterate, as part of the strategic, strategic alliance last year, September 19th, uh, 2019, Oracle is now a VMware VCPP uh, uh, part of the VCPP program. And there were two landmark, uh, uh, the two landmark decisions. One was the change to the metalling node and the fact that now we have a new product called OCBS. But I'm going to have Ryan talk about the OCBS in a bit more detail. Yeah, so yet another announcement this year. We are running VMware on Oracle Cloud. So again, very similar solution. Runs a full software-defined data center, vSphere, vSAN, and NSX, and then allows that adjacency to any of the native Oracle Cloud services. It's all bare metal, you know, very similar offering, but again, it is also sold and operated by Oracle. It's not something that, you know, is purpose built like the VMware Cloud and AWS solution. All right, so to quickly wrap up the session here, right? So there are, uh, you know, this slide, we have provided a lot of links and essentially that talks about running Oracle workloads on a VMware platform. There is also the understanding of VMware Oracle support and licensing, but there's an external solution page 
that takes you straight to the business critical application website and that hosts the oracle vertical but uh, you know everything and anything that you want uh, on running oracle workloads on a vmware vcr platform whether that's on vcr that's on vsan whether that's on vmware cloud on aws best practices deployment guide workload categorization guide anything and everything can be found in the one stop shop and the url is that at the bottom of the slide but i think uh, and this is me i'm going to quickly skip over to ryan i think we are at the end here and yes we are now open for question and answers so thank you for listening